Good morning to all of you, my brothers and sisters in the Philippines. <clears throat> it's such a pleasure to be able to be with you this morning through this uh, virtual mode. Perhaps I must say, Magandan Umaga, which uh, you have taught me when I was in the Philippines uh, last year at the festival. I'm happy to be able to do the message this morning, and I want to begin with a, a rather sad story that I had read in the newspapers some time back. As you all know that we are going through this pandemic now for some time. We have been struggling and facing all kinds of hardships because of the lockdown. And it has caused tremendous amount of upheaval uh, in almost all over the world. The story is about a farmer, a poor farmer in India, uh, who was struggling to make ends meet. And because of the lockdown, he was unable to continue with his work, to be able to uh, you know, sell his produce. And so he came to a point in time where he had absolutely nothing to be able to feed his family in terms of resources. And so the last prized possession that he had was a mobile phone. And to be able to look after his family of two, two children and his wife, he decided to sell his mobile phone, hoping that he would get a, a good price and be able to use that money to provide for his family. He did find a buyer. He sold his mobile. And what he did was he bought enough provisions for the family. And after he did that, uh, one evening he just said that he's going out. And unfortunately, he never came back. And it was later discovered that he had ended his life by committing suicide, hanging from a tree. The story is so tragic that a man would, you know, be able to, I mean to say, to uh, go to a point where he would be so distraught that he would end his life. But before he did so, he also showed that tremendous love for his family in trying to do whatever he could to be able to make them comfortable at least for some time. And that story got me thinking, and I asked myself, the, the, the loss one feels when one goes through situations like this, the tremendous amount of uh, trauma one feels when they cannot have the dignity to feed their own families. And then coming along with that is a sense of loneliness. Uh, one feels so alone because of having to go through difficulties of such a nature. And it's very, very hard to bear. And so the question for us today is, you know, suffering. We as human beings experience all kinds of suffering, physical and emotional. And the pain sometimes is so hard to understand and then to be able to bear it. Suffering is one of the most difficult human experiences for us uh, in this world and in this time. And this suffering tends to get intensified when we face a sense of isolation, when we feel alone. And we as Christians who belong to the faith obviously are not immune to the sufferings that we see in the world. We can read in the scriptures that the many stalwarts of the Bible also faced all kinds of difficulties and all kinds of problems, many of them being driven to all kinds of various kinds of despair. And so the question I want to ask this morning is, and I'm sure it is a question that has gone through all our minds, where is God when we go through these circumstances of life? Is he present with us? Does he care if he is present? Is he willing to intervene, to help? 
And so we wonder with these questions and keep asking and wonder where God is. And there is a man in the Bible and all of us know that one of the books in the Bible deals with some of these questions and some of these very, very painful situations. And I'm referring to the man Job. Job felt so, I mean, so, so pained with his trial as he was going through his difficulty. Job asked many questions. And one of the questions is what we are asking today. Where is God in my suffering? Is he present with me? And does he really care? I like to read from the book of Job and, uh, you know, use that same question that Job uses for us in our own situation right now. Let me read from Job chapter 23 and I will read verses 8 and 9. Job 23 verses 8 to 9 says, here Job in his pain uh, says the following, But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. And so, the question Job is asking is, where are you, God? I don't see you, either in the north or the south, east or west. And I'm sure that all of us felt that way. I confess that on many occasions, I've asked the same question. Where are you, God, in a situation like this? Today, I want to encourage you and me, all of us, that indeed God is not absent. That indeed God is present and is completely aware of the difficulties we face and we go through. I want to use the rest of this time to bring us a sense of comfort that God is aware of what we go through in life. And not only that he is aware, but that he cares for us. And finally, I want to also for us to understand that God suffers with us. So I've titled the message today, When You Suffer, I Suffer. And that is God telling us that when we go through these various kinds of traumas in life and the various physical and emotional pains, God sometimes is very much present in our suffering that he feels it personally. Let's go to the first point. The first point I want us to remember is God is aware. And we have an interesting story in the scriptures. And it's the story of Hagar and Ishmael. You are very familiar with it. But as we have been led in the reading, I want to pick up a few verses from the book of Genesis chapter 21. And let us see what it says in verses 11 and 13. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Here we know the story of how Abraham had Ishmael through his slave woman, Hagar. And of course, uh, Sarah was very upset with that. And she wanted to get rid of uh, Sarah and, I'm mean, sorry, the Ishmael and uh, Sarah. A domestic fight took place. And Sarah made the cruel decision to have Hagar and Ishmael abandoned because she didn't want them coming in the way of her grooming Isaac, who was her promised son. And so they decide to leave Hagar and Ishmael into the desert. And we all know when someone is asked to move away into the desert, it was certain death. Now, was God aware of what was, going, what was happening? Was God aware of what was going to happen? 
Certainly he, he is. And that's what the scripture tells us. That God spoke to Abraham and told him to make proper provision for Hagar and Ishmael. So God was very much aware. And perhaps the message for us is that we must, be, we must not feel tempted to feel that God is not aware. That he doesn't hear us. That he is absent. That he does not choose to know what's going on. He was so very much aware of Ishmael who was not the son of promise. Like we know, it was Isaac who was the son of promise. Now, if God was willing to be aware and make provision for a son that was not of promise, how much more he is aware of us who are the children of faith, those of us who belong to the faith that he has called us into. And I can relate to that from a personal situation in my own life at this moment. As I struggle through various problems that I'm facing in the church. For me it is very reassuring to know that someone knows about it. And it is Dr. Eugene Guzon as well as Dr. Greg Williams. Who are now the leaders who are leading us uh, in our fellowship. Who knows about the situation I am going through. And that is so reassuring. It is so reassuring to know that. These people know. And so how much more reassuring it is to know that God himself knows. So God is aware. But God also cares. And that's a second point I would like to bring out. God not only recognizes our difficulty. He not only sees it in all its dimensions and all its gamut. But he also cares for us. Once again, Let's go back to that story of Hagar and Ishmael. And let us pick it up in verse 17 of Genesis 21. In Genesis 21 and verse 17 and 18, it reads, What is the matter, Hagar? And this is God speaking. Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. So we have God's intervention in this story at this moment. As Hagar and Ishmael walk into the desert, obviously they have come to a point of near death. They have no water to drink. They are now dying of thirst. And, and Hagar, not wanting to see the boy perish, leaves him uh, at a distance. And then she wonders what is going to happen next. When God intervenes and God tells her and asks her to lift up the boy and take him by the hand. To me, it is very obvious that God not only is aware, but he cares. And in this case, he did intervene to provide for Hagar and Ishmael. And he indeed saved them from sure death. And it reminds me of a scripture in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5 where it tells us that we must cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. So it is very clearly written in the scriptures that God not only is aware but he is willing to care for us and do what is necessary to provide us the strength either to cope or to remove that particular trial. That we may be going through. Now sometimes we might not experience. Uh, God's provision and his intervention in the way we would want. But the point I would like to make is. No matter how God chooses to intervene. We should never doubt that he cares for us. We should never be tempted to think that. God is indifferent to our suffering. And so. I come to the third point, and which is a very important point in this discussion, that God suffers with us. Not only is he aware of our circumstance in all its uh, detail, not only does he care for us and provide for us in the way that he knows is best, but God also sometimes suffers with us in our trial, in our difficulty. And why does he do that? And obviously, 
It is because he is aware and it is because he cares. And at this moment, we need to recognize that our faith, our Christian faith, has the cross. We, we are always reminded of the cross. When, I, when we talk about that God suffers with us, we need to realize that an integral part of our Christian faith is the cross. And the cross symbolizes a suffering God. A, the cross symbolizes a God who is willing to come down to experience what we experience in all its detail. And that is the reason why we believe in the incarnation. The incarnation is, is, is also uh, true of the fact that he was willing to take our sufferings upon himself. And of course, he bore it in the most uh, difficult way, and that is to go up to the cross. There is a word in the English language which talks about excru excruciating pain. And the cross is a symbol of the excruciating pain. The word excru excruciating in the English is from the Latin excruciare, which means the pain being so extreme. And our God was willing to go through that. God in Jesus Christ suffered for us so that he could be in solidarity with us. God suffers not just for an experience, but for the reason to take that pain from us. Perhaps I, should, I could say to absorb that pain from us, bear it in him, in his humanity for us. And as he does that, he points us to the ultimate victory. And we all know that is the resurrection. Even as the cross uh, points to a death, it also then uh, comes to a point where we see the victory of the resurrection. So pain and suffering, trials and difficulties is ultimately swallowed up in the victory of the resurrection, life over death. And death and pain and suffering will one day have no dominion over us. It's very interesting. I'm not sure if you have seen it, but there is a statue which is called Christ the Redeemer statue. And I, I think it is in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, this statue is a statue where Christ spreads out his arms. And recently, somebody decided to project a mask on that statue. And it was very interesting to see Christ's statue with a mask. And the way I look at it is, obviously we know that, uh, that the mask is not to protect the statue. We know that Christ doesn't need a mask to be protected from the virus. But the way I look at it is this. As that mask remains on the face of the statue, it is symbolic of Christ suffering with us in this pandemic. Christ is willing to suffer with us in this time of great distress and great difficulty for the entire world. So brethren, what is the learnings that we can take away from this? What are some of the applications that we might be able to glean from the discussion that we have had so far? One is that suffering is a part of the human existence. We cannot deny that. We cannot get away from that. But the important thing for us to remember is that God is aware. Every moment of our pain, every tear that we shed, God is aware of every last detail in our life, including the sometimes the excruciating pain that we go through. And so as we know that, we should never give in to the temptation of thinking that we are all alone in our suffering. God has promised never to leave us, nor to forsake us. And even in the most difficult moments of our life, God is there and God is aware of what we are going through. Not only is he aware, but he cares for us. Now, 
He cares for us perhaps for in, in our understanding in mysterious ways. But we do know that there is comfort and God provides that comfort. We are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that God is a father of compassion and a God of all comfort. And perhaps that's a good reminder for us on Father's Day that we have an eternal father, a spiritual father, who is not only a father of all compassion, but of all comfort. And so he is aware of our problems, but he also cares to provide comfort and give us the strength to cope with the difficulties we face. And finally, he also suffers with us. He is not immune to our suffering. Now he suffers with us not because he is helpless, but he suffers with us to finally vanquish and defeat that suffering. He is absorbing it into his humanity. He's taking that and bearing it in himself so that one day he could usher us and bring us to the point where we can live in eternity where there is no pain and no suffering at this time. So as we reflect on some of those points and some of those thoughts, I would now like to lead you into the communion. And now as we celebrate communion together, let me make a few uh, comments and read a scripture before we do that. First and foremost, the communion, as we understand the ritual today under the new covenant, is, I think, a very vivid picture. The bread and the wine depicts so very clearly of God's suffering for us. And... It shows that he cares, he shows that he is aware, and he is willing to participate in our suffering. The Apostle Peter makes an interesting point, which I would like to read uh, his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. It says, For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. We are told in the scripture that God is willing to suffer for us. And for what reason? It is obvious to bring us to God. Jesus participates in our suffering, in the humanity that he has taken, so that he can draw us closer and closer to God. He participates with us so that we can participate with him in his perfect, loving, eternal and triune life. So let us take the communion today in the assurance that God is always aware and he's willing to participate with us in our suffering because he cares for us. Let me pray as I uh, as we take the elements together. Let us now take the, the communion uh, in the assurance that we have been given through all the discussions we have had so far and what the Apostle Peter tells us. Let us pray before we part partake of the elements. Gracious, loving Father, we come in your presence as brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever we might be, and we ask for your blessings upon these elements, which you have instituted for us, a powerful reminder that you are aware of all that we go through, and in your loving care, you participate even in the suffering that we face. And so we ask your blessings upon this bread broken for us, and upon this wine which is symbolic of the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us on the cross and established the new covenant that we might be drawn into you and someday enjoy the fullness of the triune fellowship and communion for all eternity. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us take the bread. 
which is symbolic of the broken body for us, that we might have healing and complete healing in its fullness at the time God has appointed, the bread and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take the wine, which is the blood shed for us to establish the new covenant so that one day all of all the pain and suffering that we experience will be completely vanquished and we will be ushered into the presence of our great God for all eternity, the blood of Jesus Christ. May you now continue to experience his love and live in his grace and remain in his communion and fellowship always, whether in good times or in bad, we know that God is aware of our situations and he comes to care for us and even suffer for us. And God bless you all.